Request to a Year by the Australian poet Judith Wright appeared in her 1955 collection The Two Fires and describes an incident which must have taken place more than a hundred years previously involving her great-great-grandmother. One day she and her children are by the side of a river in Switzerland, presumably somewhere in the Alps. She is perched up high on a rock making the most of this snatched moment of free time to sketch, while her children, seemingly unsupervised, play below. Her second eldest son, balanced on a small piece of free-floating ice, drifts down the river towards a waterfall and almost certain death, while her daughter, hampered by all the petticoats under her long dress, tries to save him by reaching out with an alpenstock or spiked hiking pole. Miraculously, the pole saves him, although this dramatic rescue and near-death experience are not the focus of the poem. It is, rather, the way in which Wright's great-great-grandmother, a helpless onlooker, knowing that she can do nothing to save him, summons all the mental strength she is able to to detach herself from the parental emotions that this traumatic incident would naturally inspire, so that she may instead sketch the scene in front of her with a steady hand in order to preserve the incident for posterity in an act of maternal love. And it is this attitude to life where there's a certain strength in accepting when you are powerless to act how you would otherwise wish that the poet requests the following year to gift her. The poem seems to be autobiographical in that the poet is describing an inherited memory, an incident in her own family history, which has been passed down the generations via the surviving sketch which documents it. Apart from the admiration she clearly has for her great-great-grandmother's stoicism, or mental strength. Wright also uses this poem to explore subjects such as motherhood, art, memory, inheritance, the documenting of history, and the restrictions placed on women due to the social norms of the 19th century. The poem is 22 lines long and is divided into five quatrains or stanzas of four lines and one rhyming couplet, which is a single stanza of two lines. It's written in free verse, i.e. it has no base metre or fixed rhythmical structure and no set rhyme scheme. Although a number of the lines, i.e. the second and fourth in the third, fourth and fifth stanzas, as well as the final couplet, do feature masculine or single end rhyme. Other techniques, such as alliteration, e.g. painting pictures, consonants, e.g. struck, rock, bottom, 80 feet below, enjambment, and caesura, give the poem cohesion, musicality, and rhythm, which enhance the poem's main preoccupations. The first and final stanzas act as a framing device, as Wright reflects on what she would like to be in store for her over the next year, while the middle stanzas recount the incident, evidenced by the surviving sketch, which has inspired her request. Her diction is plain and simple throughout, and, apart from the personification of the year in the first stanza, whom she apostrophises in the final stanza, and the use of synecdoche, in the penultimate and final stanzas. There's a complete absence of figurative language, such as simile and metaphor, which makes the poem's content easily understandable. The poem also consists of only four sentences, with the lengthy first one comprising the first four stanzas. This very straightforward and spare language and the way in which the entire incident up to the rescue of the boy is encapsulated in one sentence not only perhaps serves to mimic the quick, 
clean lines of her ancestor's sketch, which she would not have had sufficient time to make more elaborate, but also serves to create a tone that is quite impersonal and detached, perhaps echoing the steadiness of the attitude of Wright's great-great-grandmother, evidenced in the steadiness of her hand, which she could only achieve through detaching herself from the trauma of the moment, as well as reflecting and reinforcing one of the poem's other central messages, which is that the impulse felt by females to create art has historically been inhibited or hampered by emotions and concerns from which male artists have been largely isolated. The title, Request to a Year, indicates to the reader that the poem will focus more on what Wright would like to take away from her inherited family memory, rather than the incident which has inspired it. In the first stanza, Wright asserts her desire to take on her female ancestor's mental outlook on life. If the year is meditating a suitable gift, I should like it to be the attitude of my great-great-grandmother, legendary devotee of the arts. Note how Wright uses the verb meditating here, which means considering or pondering, to personify the year to highlight the idea that she very much sees her grandmother's attitude as an heirloom in its own right, which can be actively bequeathed. We quickly learn that her great-great-grandmother had an attitude worthy of admiration and emulation, and that she was a legendary devotee, or was well known for being an enthusiastic supporter and fan of the arts, such as painting, music and literature. The fact that we're given this information so early on in the poem more than hints at its importance. The relevance of her love of painting and drawing becomes clearer as she continues, who having eight children and little opportunity for painting pictures, sat one day on a high rock beside a river in Switzerland. Not only does this stanza set the scene by establishing where she was and who she was with, but it also, in a very few words, gives the reader an indication of the restrictions and expectations imposed on females by society in the 19th century. Having as many as eight children would not have been unusual during the 1800s, as there was no birth control, the infant mortality rate was high, and it was widely accepted that it was a religious duty to have lots of children of whom it was exclusively the mother's role to take care. Note that there is absolutely no mention of Wright's great-great-grandfather in this tale. It's no wonder then that the overwhelming majority of artworks were produced by men rather than women, as most women would have had little opportunity for painting pictures, even if they had wanted to. Note the alliteration of painting pictures, the plosive p sound already in evidence in the earlier opportunity which perhaps subtly hints at Wright's own dismay at the historical inequality of the sexes. In the third stanza, we find out that, perched high as she is, it is from a difficult distance that she viewed her second son, balanced on a small ice floe, drift down the current toward a waterfall that struck rock bottom 80 feet below. An ice flow, or flow, is a piece of free-floating sheet ice, a bit like a raft, upon which the boy is playing. Note the way in which the plosive alliteration of difficult distance seems to enhance the way in which his mother is prevented from assisting in the rescue, while the enjambment helps to conjure the way in which the situation, as well as the river, is fast-moving and unstoppable. The guttural consonants of struck rock and the plosive consonants of bottom 80 feet evoke the violence of the falling water and the hardness of the ground below. Meanwhile, her second daughter, impeded, no doubt by the petticoats of the day, stretched out a last hope alpenstock. 
Up until the early 20th century, women and girls wore long dresses to hide their legs for reasons of modesty, and these often had layers of petticoats underneath them. Not only to shield the outer dress from skin which could become dirty and sweaty due to the fact that bathing was less frequent than it is today, but also in order to create a fuller and more attractive shape by making the waist seem smaller. Wright seems to be making another comment here on the way in which females were reduced to mere demurely decorative objects with no thought given to the way in which this hampered how they lived. Note the way in which the son is free to play about on the ice flows on the river while the daughter remains on the bank, no doubt restricted by her cumbersome clothes. She does, however, manage to reach out with a last hope alpenstock which is a long wooden pole with an iron spike tip used by shepherds in the Alps in order to try and snag him to safety. The compound adjective last hope, clearly communicating the peril in which he finds himself. Note the interweaved consonants in these lines of the plosive p, t and d sounds. Second daughter impeded, no doubt, by the petticoats of the day stretched out a last hope alpenstock, which makes articulation of these lines trickier, perhaps in order to evoke the difficulty of the young girl's actions. The final line of the stanza reveals that the boy was, against the odds, rescued, which luckily later caught him on his way. The way in which Wright places this inside parentheses suggests at least as far as Wright is concerned, that this is a mere afterthought that needs to be included for completeness only in order to satisfy the reader's curiosity, but that is almost an irrelevance in terms of what she takes away from this anecdote, which is instead her great-great-grandmother's evaluation that nothing it was evident could be done by her, and her consequent act which was with the artist's isolating eye to hastily sketch the scene. With great mental fortitude, she has been able to isolate herself from her identity as a mother, to channel her identity as an artist, in order to achieve the necessary steadiness in her hand, to be able to document the scene and provide a record of her son's last moments. Note how Wright employs a synecdoche here to underscore the way in which she has cut herself off from her emotions. She concludes the stanza with the simple statement, the sketch survives to prove the story by. The anecdote, as well as the physical drawing which verifies it, has become an heirloom, passed down from generation to generation and reminds the reader that history is a collection of narratives based on physical documentation that is often produced by men. Not only does the sketch provide evidence of an incident which would otherwise have been forgotten, but it also documents the character of a formidable woman. The poem concludes, Year, yeah, if you have no Mother's Day present planned, Reach back and bring me the firmness of her hand. Wright employs a technique known as apostrophe here to directly address the year ahead of her, to request, using the imperative mood, her ancestor's attitude. Her use of synecdoche, the firmness of her hand, again separates her actions from her emotions to underscore the idea that she is not heartless and uncaring. It's interesting also to note that she desires this ability as a Mother's Day present, as she clearly sees what her ancestor did, not as an act of callous indifference in respect of her son, but one of the deepest maternal love. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below, and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.